Hi, everybody, and welcome to Exploring Stellwagen Bank 2020. This program is all about new life after tragedy, exploring the Portland shipwreck. I'm Hannah McDonald, Education Specialist with NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. I'll be on screen today alongside our research team located in Situate, Massachusetts, as well as some underwater footage coming from a remotely operated vehicle named Pixel, showing you the Portland located in Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. Now I'm also here with all of you. This model that we're using is called telepresence. Now telepresence enables us to bring a ship's feed of underwater to the shore, to scientists, and to all of us so that we can partake in exploration. And especially during this national health crisis, we can do it very safely remotely. Given that, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries are leaders in ocean science and exploration. They're also actively committed to adjusting and monitoring the COVID health crisis to keep their staff, research partners, and their families safe. That's why I'm here at the Mission Control Center in the Inner Space Center at the University of Rhode Island by myself. I have my mask in my pocket for when I inter interact with the production team, but for this program, I wanted to be able to share my smile with the audience. Our team in Situate, Massachusetts, which is Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary's headquarters, is also all outside, far apart from one another, so that they can watch the live programming as well as interact with you and share their smiles with you as well. As I've mentioned a few times, you are all a part of the program as well. I know that we have Prospect High School's oceanography class tuning in with us. We have the Cape Cod Maritime Museum tuning in and Soundwater Stewards tuning in, as well as all of the other locations that you've seen broadcasted on this program. I wanna know where all of the live viewers are tuning in from too. So if you are on YouTube, Facebook, or a website where you can type in where you're coming from, please let us know and we will talk about where you're from after our next introduction video that tells you a little bit more about today's program and the mission so far. 842 square miles, up to 600 feet deep, the final resting place of hundreds of shipwrecks and one of the top 10 whale watching destinations in the world. Located 25 miles off Boston, Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary is home to a rich assortment of marine life, including Atlantic cod, haddock, flounder, bluefin tuna, and many species of whales, including the critically endangered North Atlantic right whale. Stellwagen Bank also contains vast numbers of shipwrecks, ranging from wooden sailing ships to modern fishing trawlers. These wrecks are both windows into the past and important habitats for marine life. Stellwagen Bank Sanctuary is one of 16 marine protected areas within the National Marine Sanctuary System, a network of more than 600,000 square miles of underwater parks. Managed by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the sanctuaries promote responsible, sustainable use of ocean and Great Lakes resources. 
to foster the public's connection with the ocean, NOAA awarded funding to Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, often referred to as HUI, to conduct state-of-the-art research. Based on nearby Cape Cod, HUI is the world's oldest and largest nonprofit ocean research and education institution. In 2019, tools and technologies pioneered by HUI and their partner, Marine Imaging Technologies, let us share high-resolution images and interact with viewers in real time. This year, those same remote tools allow us to carry on our work during the pandemic. In early March, we added innovative microwave technology that beams data to shore, providing faster communication and better images. And we adapted our research model to include a smaller crew at sea and broad distribution to partners on land. COVID-19 has changed many aspects of our lives. But with careful preparation, social distancing, and technology, we can safely continue researching the ocean floor and sharing our discoveries in real time with you. I hope you enjoyed that sneak peek into today's program. You're going to learn a ton more from our research team. And from the comments feed, I've noticed that we have people tuning in from across the country, from Seattle all the way to Ithaca, New York, and even in Cincinnati, Ohio. So welcome all of our viewers. Where you typed in where you're coming from is also where you can type in your questions to our research team. We'll address those at the end of the show during the question and answer period. So if you think of one, feel free to type it in whenever you'd like. Given that, I think it's time we turn over to Ben Heskel, Deputy Superintendent of Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. Ben is going to share with us the history of the Portland and other shipwrecks within Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. Hi, Ben. Hey, Hannah. Thanks uh, for joining us and thanks to everybody out there for joining us for this uh, revisit of the wreck of the steamship Portland which is uh, the most important shipwreck in Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. I want to start by orient orienting the viewers to the wreck of the Portland using this model beside me. This model is a model of what she looked like in her heyday. Um, and clearly she's a side paddle wheel steamer, um, but this is not how she looks today. Um, Everything from this deck level up, the superstructure, is gone. And, um, and what remains are the base of the smokestacks and the walking beam here. Uh, the paddle wheels are deteriorated and gone. Um, and so in, um, in last year with the remotely operated vehicle, we uh, were able to cover pretty much the entire uh, port side. And we came around and did a little bit of the uh, starboard aft side and looked around the walking beam area. Um, and this year we were able to complete um, pretty much the rest of image, the rest of the, of the wreck, um, as well as, um, as, well as uh, more of the walking beam area. Um, and uh, along the way, we, uh, we found some nets uh, draped on the, on the port bow and along the starboard side here. So the Portland sank, um, was lost in 1898 in the, uh, in the largest uh, storm of the, of the 19th century, the perfect storm, which was named after, uh, the, it was named the Portland Gale after, after the wreck or after the ship. Um, and uh, all 192 passengers were lost in this tragedy, which remains New England's greatest uh, maritime tragedy to this day. Um, the, 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 uh, the passengers uh, left, um, or the captain decided to leave at 7 p.m. Um, the uh, Saturday after Thanksgiving and uh, head for Portland. Uh, well, it never arrived and uh, all hands were lost in that uh, in that sinking. 
The mystery of the Portland's loss and location lasted for almost a century. But in uh, 1989, um, two uh, shipwreck explorers, it, with the help of a uh, oceanographer from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, were able to um, locate the, the wreck um, and, um, and they weren't absolutely able to confirm her identity uh, because they ran out of time and, and, um, and they didn't have exactly the right equipment. But um, in 2001, uh, one of the researchers, Arnie Carr, revealed to me where the Portland lay. And so in 2002, I put together a team and we went out um, with the help of the National Undersea Research Center at UConn and uh, we're able to use side scan sonar and a remotely operated vehicle to actually confirm that this was in fact the Portland um, line there. And we were able to obtain the first pictures and video of, of the wreck since her sinking. Um, now with, with new technologies, uh, we are able to unveil some of her secrets, like why did she actually sink? And, um, and you know what are the artifacts that uh, can be found on her, and what is uh, her condition now after after um, well one year since we were there last uh, a year ago, um, and through the images that are collected with the ROV, we can now build a 3D model, uh, not just rely on a physical model, but build a 3D model of of what she actually looks like now. Um, we know the, the Portland um, uh, went down uh, the morning after um, uh, she departed, the morning after she departed uh, for Portland. Um, and we know this because of her location and the tides and the currents that, uh, uh, that were um, predicted for that time uh, based on hind casting. Um, and and it's 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 easy to or it's it's painful actually to imagine what the families were going through uh, as the ship was getting destroyed by these giant ocean waves. Um, eventually, the waves uh, overcame her. They flooded the hull and she sank to the bottom where she uh, rests now upright on her bottom and the all that's left is the hull so we can now confirm um, that all of this superstructure uh, is gone and uh, all that's left are the base of the smokestacks and the walking beam uh, sitting up proud in the water column um, and uh, in our investigations, we came across some, uh, some cups, teacups, and plates. The plates are still stacked here in this galley area. Um, and again, we found some new um, fishing trawl nets on the uh, port bow and on the starboard side. <clears throat> um, so um, for Stellwag and Bank National Marine Sanctuary, you know, inventorying and documenting and protecting historic uh, shipwrecks and resources is a really important mission. It's, it's, uh, it's, um, it's one of our two missions, which is protect the natural uh, resources of the sanctuary, as well as the cultural and historic resources. Um, so uh, this is a really important uh, mission for us uh, this year, as it was last year. Um, and the seafloor uh, of the sanctuary contains well over 47 uh, shipwrecks that we know of, and there are many, many more that we don't know of and uh, whose name um, we haven't uh, identified. And that's one of the things we're going to be doing tomorrow is taking you to uh, the mystery coal schooner, uh, and we call it the mystery because we don't know its name yet. Um, and so um, stay, stay tuned for tomorrow's uh, uh, exploration of the, of the mystery collier. Um, and um, with me here, um, 
here at the Marine Operations Center in Situate, Mass. is Dr. Calvin Myers, who is our project archaeologist. And Calvin is going to help us interpret the images that you're seeing now live on, on the screen, uh, as well as discuss uh, some of the reasons why the Portland uh, may have gone down. So I'll turn it over to you now, Calvin. Thanks, Ben, for that introduction. I really appreciate it. My name is Dr. Calvin Myers, and as Ben noted, I'm the maritime archaeologist, and one of our goals is to figure out uh, what happened to uh, the Portland after the sinking and using some of this technology by uh, Marine Imaging Technologies and going down 500 feet deep to really put together a visual virtual excavation. Obviously, we can't go and uh, excavate in person. So we rely on technology as Ben, I saw some teasers there of the 3D model that we're virtually raising the shipwreck to you. And as we go through, you'll see it on the screen. And as we come in, you can see we're working down the starboard side. There's a paddle wheel guard. And you're gonna see some artifacts come into the foreground. You'll see some cups that Ben mentioned, some plates, something that looks like a hoop that's actually a pipe that's been bent during the trauma. You'll see the outer hull. If you look really closely as it pans back, you might even see a little redfish here or there, but you can see that we've painted in, as we call it through the ROV, the, um, the starboard hull and exterior showing the nets. And all this provides us clues on what happened. And uh, we call it site formation processes, but we're really trying to figure out what happened and what possibly could be uh, the causes for this wreck. And one of the great kind of uh, analytical and educational tools with these 3D models is that we can go where no, no one can go and take a look at, including what Ben had mentioned is the walking beam or the heart. This is the engine. This walking beam was 30 feet tall at A-frame. Think of an Eiffel Tower with a big seesaw on the top that moved a 12-foot piston down into a 62-inch diameter uh, cylinder. All of this to make the paddle wheels move at 15 knots, trying to beat back the storms, the waves as they went through. And it had never been seen. And what you're looking at, or what you just saw on the screen, was that virtual model that we can twist and turn and get in and sign the pressure gauges and possibly a broken piece. The crank arm has separated from the paddle wheel shaft. Now this caused the wreck. It's a high contender for a hypothesis. And right now, Pixel has deployed a PPE, a small robot to go inside to look at the underneath the decks, to look at the coal bunkers, to determine whether or not they even had fuel. Maybe they ran out of fuel. Maybe some of you have had that experience when your cars run out of fuel. This was a much more tragic turn. And in today's COVID-19 um, world, we have learned just the power and the significance of the essential workers. And down at the bottom, shoveling in the coal and working the engine would be Chief Engineer Tom Merrill and Stokers Hugh Merriman and John Gately. And they would be pushing in the coal over and over out of the view of everybody, but they were keeping the ship alive. And above, the panicked passengers would be looking for comfort. And who would they be turning to? Steward and stewardesses. And we see the plates that they served. And one such individual, like Eben Houston, perished on the wreck. He was a second steward, one of the African-American crew, one of um, between 19 or 30, depending on what sources. And one of the reasons it's difficult to know is because they didn't keep an inventory back in Boston. And sometimes the newspaper reports got it wrong. For example, they indicated that Eben went down with his wife and daughter. Well, that wasn't the case. They were back in Portland, but they'd only been married for 11 months. In December was gonna be their first year anniversary, which never happened. But from that tragedy, I got to meet one of her descendants, her great grandson, Bob Green, who I've gotten to know along with Herb Adams up in Portland to get to know their communities and their symbol is a phoenix because Portland's been burned three times over its history and has always risen from the ashes. Redundance is its motto, to arise from the ashes. And Bob has explained that with great pride of his city that in fact, it always comes back and always thrives. And that was what we're trying to do with the story of the shipwreck Portland. We're raising it up from the ashes to bring it to you through technology such as Pixel, PPE, virtual 3D models that we can send out around the world into schools. And uh, in order to explain that, we prepared a package. And Hannah, I believe you have that ready to go. 
Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Myers. And I want to thank all of the teams that provided all of this technology to share those wonderful stories you just shared with us, as well as bring us that live feed that you saw next to Calvin just a second ago. So with that, I want to offer a time now for the audience to type in a question. So you've met Ben and Dr. Myers. You've yet to meet one member of our research team. This is Dr. Kirsten Meyer Kaiser, and her focus is biology on shipwrecks. So if you have a question related to the biology of shipwrecks, we will address that after this quick video about the technology used through this program. Deep sea research and exploration are completely dependent on technology to go where humans can't. At Stellwagen Bank, we use a remotely operated vehicle, or ROV, named Pixel to take pictures and video around shipwrecks. Pixel is relatively small, a fraction the size of deep sea ROVs. But sometimes we need something even smaller to advance our scientific goals, a penetration vehicle. This year, Marine Imaging Technologies built one, the Portland Penetration Explorer, or PPE, designed to go inside shipwrecks. PPE hitches a ride to the wreck on Pixel, then flies off and explores places even Pixel can't go. Looking inside the Portland helps us gather more information about her final moments. PPE's wide-angle, low-light 4K camera captures images from deep inside, where light is often scarce. These same images will let us build a future VR experience based around the Portland. One of our biggest technological changes this year is not underwater, but in air. Telepresence typically involves broadcasting via satellite, or VSAT. But VSAT equipment is large, heavy, costly, and poorly suited to small vessels. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we're operating with a reduced crew on a much smaller boat, the Catapult. We needed a solution that provided real-time communication to partners on land, but that Catapult could still fit and operate. So we partnered with AV Watch, who provide high bandwidth communications for the U.S. Coast Guard, Air Force, and Navy. They pioneered a new way of using microwave broadcast technology, pairing small, stabilized transmitters at sea with equally small receivers on land, or even on a plane. Their technologies provide high bandwidth data at a fraction of VSAT's cost, letting us send multiple real-time video feeds to our team ashore and helping everyone stay safe. I'm sure thankful for that microwave technology that allows us to connect to you today. So with that, we have a question coming from one of our viewers. And Dr. Meyer Kaiser, this one's geared for you. It's how deep is the Portland? The Portland is between 400 and 500 feet below the surface. Um, it's actually quite a tall wreck, so the depth across the wreck ranges, wh whether you're talking about the walking beam or all the way down to the bottom, but it's, it's pretty deep, 400 to 500 feet. So last year when we were doing our research on the Portland, I shared with our audiences the first level of analysis, just what is on the wreck, because that's the stage that I was at. But this year we've had a chance to delve into this much more deeply and do that next level of analysis. So I'd like to share some about that, which is what are the patterns in the biological community on the wreck? And I've made some great observations this summer so far. I can tell you that this wreck is pretty stratified going from the top to the bottom. The communities are pretty different. Most of the invertebrates that live on the wreck are what we call sessile suspension feeders. These are things that filter the water for their food. Examples are anemones, hydroids, or sponges. And they love to be at the top of the wreck because for them, making a living is all about being exposed to fast water currents. So they wanna be as high as possible off of the seafloor to be exposed to their food source, which is small particles or small animals out of the water column. 
Another thing is that when we go inside the wreck, which is what we're doing today, you see that those sessile suspension feeders disappear. They don't like to live inside because that's where the current is too slow for them. But the community shifts to something that's much more dominated by mobile predators like spider crabs or sea stars, which can still thrive down there, and especially the fish. Fish love shipwrecks because it provides protection from their predators and they're able to lurk in kind of the nooks and crannies and the small areas down at the bottom and especially inside the wreck to be protected and to have nursery areas for their young. So it's been really exciting to have those observations of the patterns in the biological community on the Portland this year. So with that, I'll hand it back to you, Hannah. Thank you so much, Kirsten. And now we're going to turn it over if it's available. Pixel was on the RO Pixel the ROV remotely operated vehicle was on Portland just a moment ago. So if we have the feed live available, we'll bring it on now. Ah, there it is. So we have a live feed coming from Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary on the Portland. Pretty unique opportunity to see this vessel. And while we're watching this live feed coming in, please type in your questions because we are about to address the research team with what you want to know about this mission, the Portland Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary, and any other burning questions you may have. Ah, here we have a question from Dave. Are there plans to lift the net off of the wreck? Now, I would say that this question is a great question for Deputy Superintendent Ben Heskell. Ben, are there plans to lift the fishing nets off of the wreck? Question, uh, however, there are no plans right now to lift either of the nets. There's one on the port bow and there's one on the starboard side. Uh, these are fishing trawl nets, and uh, they're very large, uh, very heavy, and they're very much um, attached or um, ensnared in, in the wreck. So it would be um, extremely dangerous and expensive um, to attempt to remove those nets, plus uh, <clears throat> we might end up damaging uh, this historic wreck even more. So... Um, so it's highly unlikely that, uh, that we'll be able to safely remove these nets, uh, even though we'd like to. So that's, that's a good question. Thank you so much, Ben. We have another question for Ben. And that question is, how many shipwrecks are there in Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary? We estimate there are over 200 uh, shipwrecks in the sanctuary. Um, that's both modern and uh, historic, modern being anything less than 50 years old. Um, but of the historic wrecks, we've been able to locate and identify um, and uh, not necessarily name, but at least uh, document 47 of those uh, historic wrecks. Um, and um, Five of the sites are listed now listed on the National Register of Historic Places, um, including the Portland, which was the first one that was listed on the, on the National Register. So um, we have uh, accomplished a lot of work uh, over the last 10, 15 years, but there's a lot more work to be done um, and many more uh, historic wrecks to explore and to try to identify which is exactly what we're going to be doing tomorrow with what we call the mystery coal schooner, um, whose name we haven't uh, uh, identified yet, but we're, we're getting close. So stay tuned. Very cool. Thank you, Ben. Maybe we can all team up together to identify this mystery schooner in the next few days of live expedition. So Dr. Meyer Kaiser, we have a great question for you coming from Ingrid. And that is, what are the particles that we're seeing floating around? So 
those are essentially dead phytoplankton and zooplankton from the surface that are raining down on the seafloor. And so when I talk about sessile suspension feeders feeding on particles out of the water column, that's what they're feeding on. That is the major food source for animals on the seafloor at a variety of ocean depths. I mean, marine snow is important going down all the way to the abyssal plain at 4,000 meters. It is the major food source for animals on the seafloor, and it's what those suspension feeders are trying to catch. Thank you so much. We have another question that I think is going to be a great one for Dr. Meyer. This one is how much of the Portland is left? So how much of the shipwreck is remaining in Stellwagen Bank? That's a, a really good question. And, and what Ben was explaining before is most of what's left is everything that you wouldn't normally see. All of the staterooms, all of what was called the hurricane deck and the main deck and where most people congregated and had a good time and relaxed. Fortunately, those were either blown off by the waves or this process where water is pushing the air up and like a balloon kind of bursts and causes a massive explosion that we uh, lose all of that uh, upper deck structure. And so what we have is really, it looks like the main deck, but it's called the freight deck. And this is where all the goods and, and uh, baggage would have been brought in and underneath. And so you're probably looking at that bottom third of the ship. And again, this is where the crew would have been. This is where their dining quarters, they might've had uh, some places carved out where they could take a nap but we're really looking at the bottom curve um, of the vessel and everything that really captures the attention in the photographs and the marketing, that's all gone, including the smokestacks where our lefts are what we call these, uh, just these funnels that have come up from the boiler. So we're really looking at the utilitarian parts of the ship that did the work that got people to and fro. And these are areas that are really diagnostic to study, to try to determine um, what possibly happened. Thank you so much, Dr. Myers. And we have another question that I think would be great for you. It's coming from Jean Christopher, and it's, is there a debris field still visible today? Yes, it's, uh, it's very shallow that we've noticed so far. Uh, it's not, uh, it's sometimes the wreck is called the New England's Titanic or the Titanic of New England, which Titanic has a very large debris field. Ours is much more contained to just outside, mostly on the starboard side. We see a lot of the artifacts that were shown in the model, including um, the dishes, the cups. And what's really interesting is how much of the fragile material survived, including panes of glass uh, that were near a washroom. We can actually have a sink with the faucet still attached. And that might indicate how it landed. It also could indicate how well they were packed away and the care with that. So it doesn't scatter for miles uh, that we've noticed. But we are also, one of our goals is to do more side scan up and down uh, the Stellwagen Bank to look for more information, including the debris field. Thank you. And we have a question coming in from Lainey and Michael. This one is going to be for Kirsten. What fish do you see most often on the shipwreck? On the Portland, the most common fish is the Acadian redfish. And you might see some in the live video. They're a red rockfish with big eyes. Um, they love being around reef structures. So redfish and other types of rockfish like that protection, the hard structure that they're able to find some shelter in. And so we find those really commonly around the Portland. Some other fish that we see are cusk and wolffish. Those like to lurk in those small spaces, especially near the bottom of the wreck. Um, and occasionally we'll get some cod and pollock coming through. Thank you so much, Kirsten. And I believe we have another question for you. This person must know that we've been visiting the Portland once in 2002 and again in 2019. So has there been a difference in the fish community since 2002, again in 2019, and then this year, 2020? Absolutely. So the original 
video recordings from 2002, which I had the chance to review. That's actually one of the things I did in quarantine was watch all those old videos. Um, the community of fish is largely dominated by cod and pollock. Um, in fact, there's one video in which pollock keeps swimming in front of the ROV's camera so that you can barely even see the wreck. There's tons of them. Um, in 2019, we noticed that there had been a decline in the cod and pollock and the rise of the Acadian redfish they were everywhere and dominating the community. It was a really distinct shift. This year, uh, we had some cod and pollock coming back. Um, I think the cusk were a bit more abundant this year than last year, or at least that's my impression. The Acadian redfish are still the most abundant that we see on the Portland wreck. There's you know, some changes year to year. And um, so I think that it's interesting to watch those dynamics and I'll be interested to see if we get to do this in future years, if it swings back. Yeah, watching those shifts is rather fascinating. We have another question for Dr. Meyer, and this one is from Joseph, and it's, I'm going to try to attempt to pronounce this correctly. Does the bacterium Holomonas titanicae, which has been found to cause rapid decay on the Titanic, affect this wreck? I think this is a great question because the Portland is known as New England's Titanic. Oh, I think you got the wrong Myers on that one. Um, uh, so um, actually, I'm going to flip that to our biologist over there and talk about the uh, Titanic and the deterioration over that. Yeah. So can we uh, flip it over to, to Kirsten, who uh, has worked with that? So... I'll preface this answer by saying I'm not a microbiologist, but to the level of my knowledge, we have not observed that particular bacterium on the Portland. Keep in mind that the Titanic wreck is much, much deeper than the Portland. So, I mean, the Titanic is, uh, it's, I, I'm not going to come up with the exact depth, but it's much, much deeper than this one. And so the bacterial communities do change over that depth gradient. And um, so we have observed some bacteria on the Portland, on the wooden hull on the side. I was finding some mats of a white fuzzy bacterium, but I don't believe that that is the same one as on the actual Titanic. Most of the degradation that we're seeing in the Portland comes from probably shipworms that are burrowing their way into the wood. Um, um, natural erosion because of the currents, and then some interactions with the fishing community. Awesome. Thank you so much. I had the wrong expert on that one, but thank you, Kirsten, for addressing the answer. Um, our next question is going to be for Ben Heskel, and it is, how does planning for this year's mission differ from 2002? So time has passed since our first expedition to the Portland. Yeah, <laughs> time certainly has passed. Um, and the main difference is, of course, dealing with the COVID pa pandemic, uh, which has uh, thrown a number of monkey wrenches in our plans. Um, but we have um, adapted and persevered. And it's uh, no short miracle that we're here today broadcasting live uh, from here um, in the Marine Operations Center, as well as offshore. Uh, from the research vessel Catapult. Uh, and we had to um, make a whole lot of changes to our, our uh, operations plan to accommodate the limitations uh, due to COVID. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, we, we, uh, we ran with it and uh, here we are today. So um, in 2002, and in fact, last year, um, it was much easier <laughs> and we could basically do what we wanted uh, without uh, concern of infecting each other or getting infected. Um, so we, we, uh, we pined for those days uh, a year ago and back in 2002, but uh, hopefully we'll return to them uh, next year or to some normality uh, next year and be able to conduct our, uh, our research uh, as, as, we, as we wish. So um, yeah, big changes can occur in a short amount of time. 
Thank you, Ben. And you've addressed some of the COVID changes that we've seen, but I've also noticed it just between 2019 and 2020, the technology changes that you saw in the tech package as well. Many changes rapidly to advance our exploration of the Portland and Stellwagen Bank. We have a question that I'm going to throw to Dr. Meyer. This one is, what artifacts have you found? So we, this year in 2020, we've been able to go where uh, we've never been able to really previously do with the technology such as Pixel, as well as um, the PPE. And so kind of give a comparison, I think in you know, 2010, there was probably around 25% of the shipwreck that had really been viewed and looked at. In 2019, we did probably around 70%. This year, we're close to 90%. And doing that, we have seen um, lots of material of the daily activities, as we've said a few times, um, plates, uh, we've a toilet bowl, um, glass panes, you'll find lanterns or um, the lamps the, in, that would be ensconced in that. And we found larger artifacts such as auxiliary boilers, windlasses, and what we're really getting is that snapshot of those, those final artifacts that remained and really can tell the story as well as, as well as the bigger pieces. Right now with PPE, we're looking to go inside and look at the boilers and to look at the coal bunkers and possibly where people would uh, be able to sleep and take a look around and things that haven't been seen before. And we're waiting for that. We're exploring live as these pictures show right now and, and they're out there doing research as we speak. So quite a holistic view of artifacts and the way to think of the Portland isn't always as a ship, but as a floating hotel. Its business was to entertain, was to have passengers relax and they could go to sleep and wake up the next day in Portland, just like you would as you were traveling. It was a very luxurious way to travel. So you have this range of both domestic uh, artifacts as well as those that were on board the ship to make their journey as comfortable as possible. Speaking of luxury, we have a question coming in from Michael. This one is also going to be for Dr. Myers. There is a long running rumor that there are diamonds on this ship. Is there any plans to look for them in the future? Um, I have very rarely ever worked on a shipwreck that didn't have some form of diamonds or gold or treasure. And unfortunately, um, I, while the rumors are out there, it's unlikely any of that is um, available or possible. It would be exciting. I will say this, that our goal is to have 100% coverage of all artifacts, including the nets, inside and out as much as we can safely do that doesn't destroy the resource. But directly, uh, there are no direct plans to look for the diamonds that rumors has it are on the site. But if we do find them, you'll probably hear about that very fast. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Myers and the rest of the research team located in Situate, Massachusetts. We have our live feed up for the ending of the show. I want to thank all of our research team, the team here at the Inner Space Center for putting on today's production, especially the team that's bringing us this live feed of the Portland right now, and all of you for tuning in to this expedition. We have more programs, including one more tonight, located on the Portland. That one will be taking place at 6.30 p.m. You'll be able to catch it on our websites as well as our social media channels. We also are going to be coming from the Mystery Schooner both tomorrow and on Thursday. Tomorrow you can catch us online at 2.30 and 6.30 p.m. Eastern, as well as on Thursday again at 2.30. So much more exploring that you can partake in and you can ask our research team anything during that time as well. So again, if you're very interested in this program, we have more information on our websites. And you can also follow the hashtag Stellwagen Deep Dive to learn more about this project. So with that, I want to thank you all again for tuning in for all of the great questions. And hopefully we'll see you again soon.